Welcome to the sequencer tutorial for Great Conjunction. Today I'm going to cover just this screen right here, uh, which is a sequencer screen. There are three sequencers in Great Conjunction. You can access them by pressing these buttons here. Uh, they can all be set independently. They all have a different glyph that travels across the timeline and also shows you uh, right on the side there which one you're on. And uh, the functionality of each one is identical, but can be tailored to whatever you kind of want it to do. Uh, the eight knobs down here generally correspond to a position on the screen. So this knob here is going to be this parameter, this knob here, this one, this knob here, this one, and so forth. So top row, bottom row. Um, the middle of the screen, for the most part, is taken up by the sequence that you're listening to or that you're viewing. Uh, so it's the top row and the bottom row are kind of what you're going to be adjusting with these knobs. The black knobs across the top are these three here will change functionality based on whatever parameter is selected. Right now, you can see up in this corner, there's a little flashing cursor, uh, and that tells you uh, which sub-parameters these two knobs will be affecting. You can also change the position of that cursor by rotating this knob. So let's say you wanted to change uh, a parameter. You can just navigate to whatever parameter you want to change, and then you can adjust its uh, sub-functions here and its evolution. This knob right here will always control the volume, so that's just hardwired to uh, the volume output. So, uh, and this button here is the play stop button. So if you're using the internal clock, this will start and stop the sequencer. Uh, this button here accesses the menu pages, which we're not going to go into, and there's a few other pages hidden deeper in that we're not gonna go into today. So let's just go right in. So. Uh, knob 1, this guy right here, you can see up in this corner, it says I48. That means you're on instrument 48, and if I turn this knob, I'm just selecting a new instrument. Um, it should be stated that this is not like a traditional sequencer. You're not plunking events down on a timeline. There's no mouse. There's no real choice of where your events are going and also the sequencers interact. So if your idea is to have, oh, I want to have like a percussion sound here and a bass line here and a lead here, mm, yeah, you can kind of do that, and then you kind of can't because the instrument engine uh, will be a combination of all three sequencers that you have running. So it's a little bit like voice stealing, but it's a little bit also like voice smudging. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's just hit play. Uh, we're on instrument 48, which is one of my faves. So you can see it's just kind of cruising along here. And if I rotate knob 1, you'll see that instrument. You can just kind of scroll through until you find something you like. So, uh, since this parameter is selected, it's got the cursor there, um, you can adjust its sub-parameters. This one right here, for all eight parameters on the screen, this one will always adjust the evolution. And by evolution, it means like, how often will this parameter change? And here's a little meter that starts to be present on the side, and it goes cranked in all the way up to that triangle, and that just means it, it's just always going to go. Um, but you'll notice that instrument isn't really changing uh, by the nature of selecting a specific instrument that can't be randomized. But you can actually scroll up through the presets into some randomization zones. Um, so here we go. So P question mark, that means you're randomizing from within presets 1 through 50, which are percussion-ish. If I bump that up, M, it, are, these are the more melody-sounding ones. So maybe a little more 
tonal, but less percussive. And so right now it's just randomizing from within bank uh, 51 through 100. And then uh, if you go all the way, you're just randomizing from any of the 100 presets. So let's crank it back so we don't go too crazy yet. We're going to crank it back to 48. The sub function knob, this guy here, you can see all your sub function information is always going to be down in this corner here. And right you, there, you can see it says len and then random. So what's happening right now is that each instrument has a length parameter, and that's like essentially kind of like uh, the release parameter of an ADSR envelope, but it's more based on time. It'll send a note off to the to the sequencer. It will send a note off to the instrument telling it to shut down. Um, but we can change that. So we can make it to these just very short length. And we can start to open it up. All the way to off. Now this means that the ADSR envelope, which is not another page, um, is now fully in effect and is not being uh, truncated by the length parameter. And then we can turn that back to random to give it a little more variety. The next parameter on this screen it just says S. That's the number of steps. Right now we've got our eight steps. Woohoo. But you can crank this all the way over and have up to 32. And you can see our little glyph is just going to cruise all the way through those two 16 bars and then jump back to the beginning. And each one of those events is randomized. You really have very little control uh, directly over what is going on there. Plenty of um, guidance. You, you can give Great Conjunction guidance, but you can't really give it direct control uh, or direct instructions. So here we go. We've got uh, an evolution parameter. Let's just crank that up and let's, you know, you can have it evolve every once in a while, or if you crank it all the way up, now you can see it's got its own little triangle there. At the end of this sequence, it should just randomize and give you a different number of steps. So now we've got 24 steps. Pretty straightforward. So now we've got 21. Another function, I'm going to stop playback just for a sec. Uh, the sub function you can see is these two arrows kind of pointing either way. Uh, this is a rotation function, so you can rotate your sequence however you want, kind of back and forth. There's been some discussion about which direction the rotation could go mathematically. This kind of fried my brain, so I actually had to put it back to where it is rotating to, for some people, instinctively backwards. So I apologize for that, uh, for those of you that want to rotate in one direction and it moves the other. But so that's a, it's a rotation right there, pretty basic. We'll set that back there. I'm going to actually change our evolution parameters down so we don't get too crazy here as we go through the things. Uh, the next uh, knob, knob three, that's the event density. So you've got all these little events on your timeline, and uh, this will control the density of events from zero in its current configuration to 100% or max. MX means max. So this is currently, I'm going to jump ahead to the fourth knob just for a sec. It's on R random, R and D. These are not truly random, they're pseudo random, which requires a seed, meaning like if I unplug this guy right now, plug it back in, and randomized it, it wouldn't, it would come up with the same sequence, which is kind of helpful if you find certain ones that you like to start with. Um, but not helpful if you want it to not always sound the same. So what your options are here, when we talk about the number of events, you can randomize uh, that. You can crank up the number. So there, just randomized right when I started, and it's like, hey, let's go 99%. And it should randomize again. 55%. So there you have it. Uh, so the sub-parameter here 
is, is the random seed, and that comes up quite a few times uh, across other parameters. So if I were to change this amount, let's go to 50%, right? Here's, a fi here's an interpretation of 50% uh, with a certain random seed. Now, if I keep the number of events or the event density at 50%, but change the random seed, we're going to see different flavors of 50% as I rotate this. So here's just different dice rolls for 50%, which just gives you different rhythmic possibilities. So the seed goes from 0 to 250. And once you hit 250, you can actually randomize the random seed. And this comes in handy. Let's say you want, you have something that you like, and it's you know running at 25%. Of the time you just you like the sound of the instrument you want it to happen roughly 25 percent of the time well now you can randomize at the end of this loop uh we'll get it going at the end of this loop it's going to give you a different flavor of 25 percent so you're not going to randomize the density you'll never come up with like oh now it's 99 percent full and now it's one percent full you're just going to always have roughly 25 percent of those events happening which I find to be pretty useful when you want to keep something sparse or full, so you don't necessarily have to randomize uh, the event density. You can randomize the random seed. Hopefully that's not too many levels deep for you there. Uh, fourth parameter. So right here, on the third parameter, as we're adjusting the event density, as I said before, this is pseudo-random. So we have three different uh, styles or algorithms to, to uh, control that event density. The next one being Euclidean. This is a pretty popular one these days. Uh, that's basically, to keep it simple, it's even distribution of events. So we have one event, it's right at the beginning. If we get two events, there'll be one right there. And as we just crank this up, these will be evenly distributed. Uh, 32 step sequence with seven events on it, though, doesn't divide equally, so you get more... Um, more interesting rhythms that way. So, you know, you can crank this all the way up and fill it up with 32 events, or you can crank it down. Uh, I, I tend to like the, the rhythms that aren't uh, evenly subdividable because you get really cool, or at least interesting sounding polyrhythms. So let's do this guy. And there's a lot to play with just inside of uh, Euclidean rhythms there. So uh, this knob for the Euclidean uh, algorithm just controls the number of events. You can go past, you're just not going to get, you can't fit 22 or 23 events in 13 steps. So it just maxes out. I could clamp it, but, you know, you, you, can, you can crank the knob all the way to 32 if you want at this point. Uh, the third option for algorithmic event placement is cellular automaton. Uh, I think this is a really fun way to do it. So in this method, your initial conditions are randomized based on event density. So you can start with... Oh, that's interesting. I don't know why there's one guy coming up there. Yay! I have to take a look at that. Well, let's say 5%. And... We'll go over to this. So now we're looking at the uh, knob four, which is your algorithm or your type of event distribution. You can randomize this as stated before. So if you want to actually change the way your sequence is being developed, you can randomize that if you want, and it'll choose from one of the three every pass or every so often, if it's cranked all the way up here, or not so frequently down there, or just leave that off and don't go crazy. Uh, the sub function for this is the rule. Uh, I cannot possibly summarize how this works mathematically for you, but I can tell you that in uh, two dimensional, no, sorry, one dimensional cellular automaton, there are 256 rules. They are all in here, and that basically determines whether or not an event lives or dies. 
interesting rule sets. I will say uh, rule 30 leads to, uh, I believe, infinitely generating patterns. So you can see if I get this going and I set the rule to 30 and I start it, it's going to generate that first one. So now you can see there's two events on the timeline it's paired up to now. Those are those are evolving. Each one, each progression through uh, the sequence will evolve. These are not randomly generated. They're generated due to whatever rule you select. Some rules end in, they are dead ends for evolution. So, you know, if you have this randomized and end up on a rule that just gives you dead silence, you might not want to choose that one. Uh, so, yeah. Now the next thing on the display here would be just the tempo. That's not adjustable from this screen. That's in a menu page. So down here on the bottom row, we have most of the note controls. Starting with this guy here on knob 5, this just chooses the base note that the sequence is derived from. Uh, in combination with the other settings down here, it will choose, uh, it will, it will transpose the sequence, so. And so, if you look here, you can evolve this. This is how you, uh, have the melody or the tonal quality the pitch quality change over time. You can crank up the evolution. So you can see that little meter down there is kind of slightly on, but if I crank it all the way up, pretty much every pitch should be uh, randomly created within the context of the octave, octave span, and scale. So let's turn that back down. Should lock that in. Hey, I kind of like that, so we'll leave that there. Uh, we'll make the sequence a little bit longer. So the sub-function here, once again, for the note parameter, is the initial random generation of that pitch. So I'm going to lose this, this, these note values here by changing the sub-function, or the seed, and you can hear that. If I get on seed 99 here, I'm going to just crank that over. So you can kind of explore different melodies or different tonal qualities in there by just changing the seed, the random seed. If you want to give it a little bit of evolution or life, you can just kind of crank up that right there. Okay, so we'll just lock that in. Here's our current melody. The The next knob over, which is this guy, is your octave. Pretty easy to understand this one. This is just the octave, uh, the bass octave from there, so we can go all the way down to one and all the way up to a shrill 8. Pretty easy to kind of wrap your mind around that. That can also be evolved over time, so if you want that octave to change. Well, doesn't really want to change, does it? Keeps not randomly rolling the dice in the area we want, so let's just crank that up. Now it's going to randomize quite frequently. All right, let's get that back under control. Okay, stepping over here, these these two settings are very related. So right now we're just locked into octave five. Well, we'll, we'll crank it down to three so we don't blast our ears out. And I'm going to turn down that evolution, and we're just going to get our sequence going again. So by turning up this knob, which is the span, this is the distance above that base octave from which it can randomize. So if I cr crank it up a little bit. So now it's choosing from uh, you know, the third and fourth. Now we can add in up to five. All the way up 
to 8 is our max. And that's clamped, so if I start to roll this up, it's not going to let the sum of these two get above 8, because it can't randomize higher than 8, so it'll clamp. And if you want that to randomize that, you can crank up the evolution. Once again, so let's give this quite a span here, all the way up, and let's listen to this. So each one of those steps has a different octave it's landing in, and we can we can randomize where it is in that span by cranking up the C. Now that should be a different pattern. We'll change to a different seed. And now we've come up with a different root uh, randomization of that pattern. Different variations of something that starts at octave three and could potentially be up to the eighth octave. And so we can change that seed and it'll just change that outcome. And lastly, over here on this knob, let's crank this down so we don't. This guy here, uh, that's our scale. There are 43 scales. I pulled these uh, from the Mono Norn scale library and added one of my own here, this is just monophonic, so this is just holding at a single note, but then you can go through all the variations. They do hold on screen for just a sec, so you have just enough time to read what you're doing. So every time you modify your scale, it will recontextualize the notes into that s scale. And that is taking into account the random seed of your note distribution here. So if I were to change this, it recontextualized based on all four of these parameters. The octave, octave span, and the scale are all taken into account. Scale does not have a sub-function. Uh, I don't think there's one that I could think of uh, that would be related to that. I'm open to suggestions, but it shouldn't be too hard to throw something else in there. And these also, let me kind of make this a little more sparse. These, uh, each sequencer, I'm in monophonic mode now, I can place it into a chord mode, and it will do everything that we have been talking about, but as chords. You can randomize those notes within the chord. Crank that up. And that kind of takes you through all of the functions of the sequencer. I'll go through some of the other parts of Great Conjunction next. Thanks.